Good morning. Brian Sims hold a holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from Blues Bloomsburg University, where he was a scholar athlete and the captain of the 2000 National Championship football team. Mr. Sims went on to graduate from Michigan State University School of Law and specializes in public policy, formerly serving as staff counsel for policy and planning at the Philadelphia Bar Association. As an advocate for the LGBTQ community, Mr. Sims speaks on issues of athletics, diversity, and ad advocacy to students, athletes, and universities such as St. Joe's and Notre Dame. A resident of Center City, Mr. Sims recently announced his candidacy for Pennsylvania's House of Representatives. Please stand and greet. Okay. Please stand and greet our speaker, Mr. Brian Sims. Thank you, everybody. You can all take your seats. Thank you so much. Wow, this is quite a room to stand in. It makes me feel like I should be more epic and powerful, so I hope that I am. Um, I want to start with one housekeeping matter, and that's LGBTQ. Um, I speak at a lot of places where people don't exactly know what LGBTQ means. Um, it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Um, I I am more than happy to talk with any of you afterward that have questions about what those mean. Um, lots of people do. That is certainly not inclusive of the LGBT community. Um, but when I say LGBT, I want you all to know exactly who I'm talking about. I also want to thank the school for bringing me in. I, as you just heard, I speak at a lot of colleges and universities um, on these issues. But I also know that there are, there are dozens, hundreds of colleges and universities in this country that are scared to bring someone like me in. They're scared to talk about this, this topic, to talk about this issue. And so I think it's very meaningful that Episcopal chose to bring me in. I want you to know that it's not an endorsement of what I'm going to say. And that's very important to me. Um, when I was first asked, I, I said I wasn't sure what the culture was like at Episcopal. How would Episcopal handle hearing someone talk about LGBT issues? And I was told that the, the culture here was one of respect um, and one of learning and that it's upon you to, to take what I say and to apply it to your spiritual lives, to apply it to your moral lives. And so I hope that you have that opportunity. Um, I'm going to be here throughout the day. And so, again, if you have questions for me, and they're not questions you want to ask in front of your peers or in front of your, your, your pr professors and the faculty, please feel free. I have great news. Um, great news if you're someone like me. And that is that there has never, ever been a better time in history to be gay. There's never been a better country in which to be gay than right here in the United States. Um, I'm a policy attorney by trade. It means that I spend my days looking at numbers, looking at statistics, demographics, trying to figure out why people think certain things. What are they going to think next year? What are they going to think next month? How are they going to vote on it? How are they going to act on it? What are they going to do about it? And a couple of years ago, I got asked to sort of apply that lens to the LGBT community, apply that lens to what we know in, in 2009, 2010, 2011 about being a gay person. And when I did that and I realized that there had never been a better time in history, it surprised me actually. You know, you hear um, some very vitriolic things used about the LGBT community from time to time. And I didn't know if that was representative of the larger community. And I didn't know if that was just something that I was um, uh, particularly in tune to. So I heard, it, I heard it more than most. And what I found is that the generation that you're all about to join, the generation of 18 to 30-year-olds, the specific demographic of 18 to 30-year-olds that are either in college or college educated, and I think that probably will apply to most of you, is the most progressive in history on a whole number of issues. By progressive, I don't necessarily mean liberal. Um, I mean forward thinking. I mean that the average college educated 18 to 30 year old in the United States views a whole bunch of key issues very, very differently than your parents did. 20 years ago, your parents, your parents generation, um, you could tell what someone's political party was by a couple of a couple of key questions. How did they feel about reproductive rights? How did they feel about women's rights? How many African-American friends did they have? 
those kind of questions were very indicative of, of in many ways, um, political parties. And they're not anymore. And they're certainly not for your generation and the generation that you're about to join. For you, the idea that someone's civil rights depend on who they fall in love with. For you, the idea that someone's rights um, should depend on, on their gender is entirely foreign. You are truly the most progressive generation in American history. But so what? What does that do? What's happened because of that? Well, specifically when it comes to my life, when it comes to LGBT civil rights, I'll tell you why it's been so important. And that is because of allies. Um, I don't even know if many of you in the room know who Dennis Rodman is. In a million years, I never thought I'd be speaking in a chapel about Dennis Rodman. Um, Dennis Rodman was a very, very colorful basketball player in the 90s. Very colorful guy. And for the longest time, people didn't really know what to make of Dennis Rodman. He would show up at award ceremonies and wedding dresses. Um, he'd show up looking good in wedding dresses at award ceremonies, quite frankly. And, you know, the, the mainstream media didn't know if he was coming out. They didn't know if he was gay. They didn't know if he, they really didn't know anything about him and what was going on. And it was a, a gentleman named Keith Oberman who, at the time when he was an anchor for ESPN, finally asked him, Dennis, this is like the third award show you showed up in a wedding dress. What's going on, man? Are you gay? Is this your way of trying to come out to us? And Dennis Rodman said, absolutely not. I'm a secure, confident, heterosexual freak. And I'm dating Madonna, is actually what he said. And for me, Dennis Rodman was sort of um, symbolic. Uh, symbolic of, of a major change that we have seen in the country, and that is with allies. I talk about allies all the time in the work that I do. Allies of women's rights, allies of reproductive rights, certainly allies of, of gay civil rights. And the reason is, is that you all, as allies, are the reason that I get to stand up here and talk about how, not only how good things are getting, but how good we've made them. Allies hold a very particular role in American society, especially when it comes to civil rights. You can find unexpected allies in every civil rights movement in US history. They're usually easy to spot. It's usually that one white guy that's like three or four people down from Martin Luther King and black and white photos of marches. Um, it's the man in the teens and the 20s that was holding up a sign that said, let my wife vote. When gay civil rights really picked up, 30, 40 years ago, we had a very hard time recruiting allies. Federal government says that we're somewhere between 6 and 8% of the population. And I can tell you that 6 to 8% of the population has a very hard time changing laws, let alone changing minds. And yet, the gay civil rights movement over the last 25 years has seen about the same movement that it took the traditional civil rights movement 65 years to accomplish. And it's because of allies. It's because 20, 30 years ago, it was very hard for a straight person to stand up and say, you know what, I have no problem with my gay cousin, my gay brother, my gay friend, my gay classmate. Generally because the moment that they did, they got subject to the same ridicule, the same um, name calling, some of the same slack that gay people do. And so it made them very hard for them to stand up and, and show support. And really because of people like Dennis Rodman who can stand up and say, you know what? I can be a secure, confident person and be around gay people. It doesn't make me gay. It doesn't rub off. Um, there's a very interesting statistic about the generation that you're about to join that I think of all the time. 80% of 18 to 30 year olds who are in college or college educated support the general package of gay civil rights. Not marriage. Um, marriage is sort of its own, its own thing, and it's, it's relatively new in the, in the spectrum of the polls that I review. But 80% of young people support the general package of gay civil rights. Freedom from discrimination, anti-bullying, um, the ability to be out at work, the ability to be out in your apartment. Quite frankly, in the state of Pennsylvania, I can be denied a cheeseburger at McDonald's for being gay. That's legal in the state of Pennsylvania. And your generation, and the generation you're about to join doesn't support that. Um, I used to tell people, this is an easy thing for me to do. I don't have to tell anyone that I'm right and that you're wrong. Um, those are value judgments that I want you all to apply using what you learn here, what you learn at home, um, the, the interactions that you have as young people. But what I know is that 
from my standpoint, you're all right too. You believe these things, you support these things. You've had more access to information by the time you, turned 18, you will turn 18 years old than your parents did until they were 41 years old. Doesn't mean you know how to handle all that information, it doesn't mean you know how to analyze it all. But purely from a basis of access to information, what's happened with your generation is it's made you significantly smarter when it comes to diversity. When it comes to recognizing that all people in this world are not the same, that all people's motivation in this world is not the same, um, but that everyone deserves to be treated with respect and kindness and fairness. So 80%. 80% of you support civil rights for LGBT people. You only think a third of your peers do. I think it's the most insidious statistic in all of this, is that by and large, you are wonderful people when it comes to your views of gay civil rights. You're actually wonderful people when it comes to your views of women's rights. But you don't know that about each other. You all think that you are islands when you're sitting here thinking, you know what, I don't have any problems with gay people. I don't really care so much either way. I'm, I'm all right with that. I'll, quite frankly, I will take apathy over, over advocacy sometimes. But you all think that you're the only ones. You think that because you have this, this view of the world that um, is based upon equality, this view of the world that's based on justice and fairness and kindness, that, that you're the only one. And you're not. In fact, statistically, the people on either side of you right now agree with you. Statistically, if you're one of the people in the crowd that doesn't support my rights, and that's, I'm going to say this very clearly, that's perfectly fine. I don't, I don't need anyone and everyone to support my rights. I need the right people to, in my estimation. But these are decisions that you're all going to have to make. You all, as, as young people, when you move on in this school and in the schools that you're at next, you get to look at the table of options in front of you of what am I going to believe about society? What am I going to believe about gay men and women? What am I going to believe about racial and ethnic minorities? And you have to weigh those beliefs against your backgrounds, against your ideology, against your faith, against your community, your education. And if you've done that type of analysis and you've walked through that path and you come out on the other side and you're an ally of gay rights, and you're an ally of women's rights, and you support racial and ethnic diversity, first of all, we're probably going to get along. More importantly, though, you will, you will have a worldview that is going to serve you very well in this world. Um, America has never been more diverse than it is right now. America has never been more educated than it is right now. America has never been more well-traveled than it is right now. I say those last two things because those are the number one and number two indicators in this country of how a person is going to view civil rights. Formal education and travel. All of you are on a really good path right now to see both of those uh, um, come true in your lives. I hope that as you walk that path that you take the time to look around you and see the, the differences in people around you. I certainly hope you take the time to look around you and see where you are similar to the people around you. I think what you will find as you do that, and I think what I know about what you're already finding, is that recognizing differences in each other and recognizing differences in, in, in the people around you doesn't negate the similarities that you share with your classmates, that you share with me. I am certain that, you know, I, I may not be uh, the best friend that m many people in this room were looking for. Um, but I also know that by virtue of having an open mind, by virtue of at least listening to what I have to say, considering what I have to say, knowing about your peers and knowing about this country, that it puts you in a better place for us to have a conversation of respect and for us to have a conversation that at the very least gives you the information that you need to make up your own mind. When I was asked to come in, I spoke with administrators at the school and I said, I'm not here to tell anyone that supporting gay rights is the right path. I'm not here to tell anyone that you should be an ally of, of PRISM um, and gay students at your school. That's, it's your decision to make. You're in the right places, you're getting the right training, you're surrounded by the right people to be able to make those decisions. My goal is that you make those decisions with the best information, with the most information. That's what I want you to know. Right now, there are more out gay people in this country than ever before, about eight million or so in just in the workforce. Right now, there are more supporters of gay people than there have ever been before. 
If you were to add up all of the gay people in the United States with all the people that support gay people in the United States, you have a significant majority. And my hope is that we act like it. I have only one thing that I want everyone to do when this is over with, and I want you to talk about it. And I don't, quite frankly, care what you say, um, whether you're supportive or not. I want you to grab the person that's sitting next to you now, grab the person that's in your next class. I want you to talk to your parents tonight. I want you to talk to your neighbors tomorrow. And I want you to tell them that you had to listen to a gay guy stand up at chapel and talk about gay rights and gay people. And you can say some horrible things if you want to. You can say some wonderful things. I hope you do. But what I know is that the more that you talk about these issues, the more that you have to think about them. And the more that you have to think about gay civil rights, quite frankly, the better that you're going to be on gay civil rights. So thank you all for having me here at the school. I'm going to be here all day. I hope to spend a lot of time with all of you, and I hope I get the opportunity to talk to most of you throughout the day. Um, but you are you're in the right place, and you're doing the right things to be able to make the right decisions. And I hope that as you are weighing how you plan to view civil rights going forward, that you think about today, that you think about your classmates, and that you think about the school and, and the values that they've taught you and the morals that they've taught you. And as you are applying those to, to your lives, I hope and quite frankly, I know that it's going to make you better people and it's going to make you more tolerant people. So thank you all for having me and I hope to see you all throughout the day.